Uh, thanks so much, Diane. It's a real thrill to, to be here with all of you. And um, my role here is just to sort of lay the stage um, of COVID, the COVID pandemic in its um, in a bit of the, the context of the, the time of crises that, that we face. So this is not uh, the first, this might be the first pandemic we experience. Uh, we're almost sure that it will not be the last. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to share my screen and just to give you, um, I've, oh, can somebody make me co-host so I can just show some slides. Uh, I don't know where Roy is. Yeah, you should be able to share now. Okay, cheers, thanks. Um, so I just want to say a few words about the, the context of the, um, the climate and environmental crises, basically. Um, and so, uh, let's see if I am sharing. So uh, there we go, so that should work now. Uh, and I'm just going to say a few words because we're going to go right into um, more information and the discussion. So basically, um, I actually don't want to get into this because you probably know this, but the emission, the causes of global warming are um, mainly emissions and uh, of carbon dioxide and methane and so on, and also deforestation changes in land use. And we'll find out that that cause is very important in terms of uh, our, our future capacity to deal, uh, to cause and deal with pandemics. It's 100% natural activity causing climate change. And in terms of our economic activities, it's basically everything. So it's electricity, transport, heating, industry, nutrition, again, very important for biodiversity and pandemics, um, buildings and infrastructure. So I'll really sort of start here, which is with the, uh, the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees that came out in 2018. So um, the, this report uh, was prepared by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it basically was supposed to help governments act, answer a question, which was what the heck had we ever signed up for? So the Paris Agreement uh, that governments, many governments had signed up to, including the UK, um, had, had said, we want to keep warming below two degrees with 1.5 degrees as a goal. And this is typical UN language where you sort of bring in lots of different contradictory things into one goal. But there was really a question like, does it make a difference? Is two degrees too dangerous? What is really diff the difference between 1.5 and two degrees? So that's why the government's commissioned this report. It's basically saying, what are we signing up for? What are the impacts if we go to 1.5 degrees or if we go to two degrees? And uh, this is just um, a sample, sort of a highlight of some of the impacts, just to show you that the, the difference between impact of 1.5 and impact of two degrees, it's not just, you know, a bit worse because the numbers seem small to us. It's a lot worse. So the first thing that I, uh, we need to know is that we are already at 1.2 degrees above um, pre-industrial levels in terms of our average global warming. So we're very much already well on our way to 1.5 degrees. We're not far away. We're going we're gonna to get there fairly soon, actually. Um, and at 1.5 degrees, uh, which means we need to turn things around soon, obviously. At 1.5 degrees, um, deadly heat waves would affect 14% of the population every five years or 37% of the population at two degrees every five years. So two degrees is two and a half times worse than 1.5. Um, the Arctic free from sea ice in summer would be once every 100 years at 1.5 degrees or once every 10 years at two degrees, so 10 times worse. Again, you see that we're really dealing with a very um, nonlinear system. Every bit of warming has a disproportionate impact. Uh, this one is um, insect species losing 50% of their range, 6%, of, which means that they're at risk of um, extinction would be 6% at 1.5 degrees, 18% at two degrees, three times worse. And coral reefs, basically, you still have maybe 10, 20 percent um, at 1.5 degrees, but at uh, or 30 percent at 1.5 degrees, if we're lucky, at two degrees, they disappear completely. So we're really facing um, a very uneven system in terms of the accelerating impacts that we face. Uh, there's also an issue of climate injustice, um, which is that uh, 
the historic responsibility of the countries that have been the most historically responsible for climate change is shown in the um, image on the on the left hand side of your screen. And on the right hand side, you have one just one category of geographic impact, which is a number of days a year on our current trajectory, give or take, um, that uh, where the, the number of days would be something that the human body can't stand. So if you go outside, you die because of the combination of temperature and humidity. And you can see that vast swaths of the tropics become uninhabitable uh, within the century on um, our current trajectory. So, uh, so that's um, quite uh, a horrific prospect. Um, you can also see that this is very unequal in terms of the countries that are responsible and that the countries that are impacted. So the countries that are responsible are in the global north, industrialized countries, and uh, the countries that are the most affected are not. So that's something to, to keep in mind. And the temperature that we're currently heading for, uh, despite all the talk about climate change and all the activism and the school strikes and every and all the governments making commitments and committing to climate emergency, basically year on year, emissions keep on rising. They rose in 2018, they rose in 2019. In 2020, there was a bit of a dip, but actually the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere kept, kept right on trucking. So it was by far not enough uh, to be what's needed. And we know that the fossil fuel companies are intending to emit more and more and more. And so what we're heading for is we're, well on, we're not on track for 1.5 degrees. We're not on track for two degrees. We're headed for somewhere um, around three degrees, if you believe current climate, um, the most ambitious policies that have been put forward by governments such as the Chinese government or Joe Biden, if they failed, we're heading for, for more than that. So uh, things are really not looking good. Um, what this means in terms of our ecosystems, what this means in terms of our species um, is nothing short of terrifying. So basically in the far distant past of the climate, the climate was warmer. In the more recent past, it was stable. If you look at the past 12,000 years, uh, which is sort of the little yellow bit on the graph, that's where we developed agriculture and civilization. And the band of temperature was very narrow around this zero of the pre-industrial temperature. Um, before that, there were ice ages. During those ice ages, Homo sapiens in the past sort of 250,000 years, Homo sapiens appeared on earth and existed in that time of ice ages and sort of uh, now this stable warm period that we call the Holocene. Um, before that, uh, past two sort of two or three million, uh, two million years ago, actually, Homo genus appeared, and we're going. To, we're already moving. Um, we're going to be moving the planetary climate clock back three million years by 2030 on our current trajectory, and that's actually a time before Homo genus existed. My blue arrow on this plot is not completely correct, um, and that's if we massively, if we massively reduce emissions, we might delay that by 10 years. But we're talking about moving the planetary system, really giving it a massive kick. Um, on our current trajectory, we might, uh, we might move it back 50 million years by 2100, by 2150s, which is an enormous, enormous shift. So we're really massively kicking um, our planetary system and it's resulting in things like massive biodiversity loss, for instance. And what it also means is because we're moving the planetary climate so fast, uh, ecosystems and species have no chance of, of adapting within that time frame. You know, 15 million years in the span of 100, that's just, we're, we're talking about destroying entire ecosystems. And indeed, what the people have calculated, so in particular, the team of Rachel Warren uh, calculated what this means. So basically what we're looking at, these are species uh, looking at all vertebrates, all plants, all insects. So this per percentage of these categories that would be at risk of extinction. And you can see that at 1.5 degrees warming, you know, considerable number go extinct, but it's not, um, uh, it's not massive. By two degrees, we're already talking larger temperatures. By three degrees, which is sort of where we're heading on our current trajectory, we're talking about a quarter of vertebra all vertebrates at risk of extinction, almost half of all plants and insects. And this is something that we can't, um, um, it means that parasitical species will come in. It means that ecosystems are gonna be clashing with each other. It means that the conditions for pandemics are going to be ever larger. So I'm just gonna conclude with, the, with this slide and the next. Basically, we're heading uh, 
we've left the climate of the Holocene, which was the climate of the last 12,000 years, which was a stable, pleasant place where we developed everything that you could call human civilization in terms of agriculture, in terms of cities, in terms of writing. We're heading into a very uncertain future. Um, maybe one of the only certain things about it is that it includes, in fact, more pandemics. That's one of the things that uh, epidemiologists tend to agree about. And one of the things we might ask ourselves is what has sent us here? Why have we, um, what, how have we come to this? Who knew about this? Who could have prevented it? And uh, this is a slide from the early 1980s uh, showing uh, our trajectory in terms of carbon emissions. So accumulating accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as well as average temperature increase. So it's showing how much carbon we're emitting into the atmosphere or sort of on our current trajectory and how much temperature, what temperature we're at. Turns out this is not a completely, it's a pretty good projection. They are a little underestimated um, the temperature rise and they overestimated the carbon dioxide a bit, but it's basically correct. And the question is who knew this? Who knew already in the seventies where they were sending us, uh, you know, 50 years ago? And the answer of course is Exxon. Um, so the petroleum companies, the big fossil fuel companies, the most profitable industries on earth knew what they were sending us into. This was an internal memo, it was not shared with investors, with politicians or with consumers. It was hidden from sight. And so this is one of the things that we have to face is that we have an economic uh, system where the most powerful actors are sending us knowingly into, more dangerous, um, into a more dangerous future. And this is something that we really have to think about when we think about how we're going to face uh, our present and future. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. That was a very good introduction to our discussion this afternoon. I now want to call on my next speaker, who is Rob Wallace, who's an evolutionary epidemiologist. Rob. Rob? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I am doing the uh, 2021 shuffle of unmuting myself. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to get into COVID uh, for this round here. Um, start by saying that diseases aren't just viruses or bacteria, nor their clinical course, what gets an individual sick and how they get sick. The causes of diseases extends out in, extend out into the fields of relationships we share with each other and with the livestock we raise and the wildlife we displace by deforestation, mining, logging, and real estate speculation. Diseases are ecological in origin, uh, but they're, they're more than that. As humanity transforms itself into a geological force on this planet, as Julia got at, they are also social in origin. The ways and means by which we decide to live together on this planet creates the combinations of opportunities and barriers for the pathogens that circulate among us. How do we live? Presently, we live largely under a system of neoliberal capitalism. States work very hard to give capital support in imposing its dictates upon landscapes and peoples far and wide. This particular passing imperium has a profound impact on how people and the larger and larger nature are treated. Capitalism alienates out humanity into labor and capital, nature into alienated nature, and our industry, our capacity to appropriate nature to survive into alienated industry. Our systems are abstracted out of the ecological basis upon which uh, we depend. At this point, our globe is encircled by a series of circuits of production from forest edge through the peri-urban landscape to a local regional capital and then back again. Some diseases, diseases emerge upon forest encroachment. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa starting 2013 is a good example. With neoliberalism imposing itself upon the region by way of structural adjustment programs, agroforestry was forced out by what uh, many in England uh, and Great Britain will recognize as enclosure, capitalization, and proletarianization. That led to the encroachment of monoculture plantations grown for export. Under such conditions, many wild species die out. Some, however, do quite well. 
especially those species that display a kind of behavioral plasticity. So many of the bats that serve as, serve as Ebola reservoirs provide, proved attracted to these plantations. I mean, what's not to like? No competitors, no predators. They have plenty of space to fly between roosting sites and uh, foraging sites. So we have uh, increasing interfaces between these bats and the humans working on the plantations or living nearby. Increasing rates of transmission and increasing diversities of the pathogens spilling over. And with structural uh, adjustment, reduced funding for public health and animal health leads to declining capacities to recognize an outbreak in motion. At the other end of that circuit of production near cities, we have large mega farms that are built there concentrating thousands, if not millions of livestock and poultry that are nearly genetic monoculture. For those pathogens, uh, like the avian and swine influenzas that circulate there, the deadliest strains are selected for it. I mean, there's no cap on how much of a badass of a strain can evolve in that context. You know, uh, you have very similar hosts uh, are butting up against each other. So you can, those, the most vicious strains are the ones that can burn right through and, and beat the other strains out. Other uh, pathogens use the entirety of the circuit of production to evolve toward pandemicity. So Zika comes to mind, but all those SARS-like strains that are now in circulation uh, are also uh, uh, evolving along that, that circuit there. So not just SARS-1, not just MERS or SARS-2, which causes COVID-19, but many coronaviruses appear to be taking aim at humanity. So we should expect something like COVID-21, 22, or 23 at some point. Um, certainly, we're not going to wait another 100 years for, for uh, another terrible outbreak like this. Um, I think that's uh, it's a consensus among the epidemiologists. What drives these circuits of production? They are driven by circuits of capital. It's why our group considers cities like London, New York, and Hong, Hong Kong the world's worst disease hotspots. These centers of capital supply the financing for the deforestation and development that he drives the emergence of these new pathogens to begin with. Now, once these, these, these diseases emerge as pandemics, different countries offer different opportunities and barriers for the new pathogens. Um, however much it's attempting to uh, get out, of, it's attempting to get out of blame, China uh, pursued its own bricks road of capitalist development. Uh, it, it, it's the place of origin for uh, COVID-19, for SARS-2. Um, that's not an important, that's not an unimportant discussion. Uh, it is, we should continue to have that. But for our purposes today, China responded to the outbreak with full suppression. They had their own uh, version of zero COVID. And after a few months, they're holding rock concerts in Wuhan. New Zealand, which was uh, brought up, it's a very different country politically, responded to COVID by keeping the virus from entering the first place or, or squashing it in, in short order. That's a different uh, zero COVID strategy. And now they're hosting uh, rugby, rugby matches with full crowds without masks, although that might be changing. I think they might be having to deal with a, uh, a minor outbreak at this point. Um, but, you know, watching this from the U.S. or, or you from uh, Great Britain, um, you can feel uh, a sense of, of, of different life going on when you act, when governance is dedicated toward helping the people that are, uh, that are ostensibly being governed. Um, but so we find in the other direction, you know, rightists or, uh, and or all the authoritarian regimes such as the U.S., Britain, and Brazil, they let the virus in and they let it circulate for months. And you have to ask yourself why? Because decades of neglecting public health or monetizing it, not only public health, but other uh, uh, social commons. And to do that for decades as a matter of principle uh, exposes you. Indeed, some of these countries have devolved into stock markets with the country attached. The ecological impact continues. You let a virus spread, you allow it to set up millions of experiments in humans around the world. You allow the virus to uh, evolve new variants. It's not a coincidence that the worst of the SARS-2 variants emerge out of countries that chose neglect, denial, or continued capital accumulation 
including variants that appear to have evolved out underneath some of the new vaccines. It's why our team named the new B117 strain that emerged in London, South England, the Bojo strain, after Boris Johnson, whose refusal to clamp down on COVID-19 permitted the virus to engage in a kind of interdemic selection, natural selection across groups that favors the emergence of new adapted strains. Now, it's not just a matter of disliking a particular uh, politician. We're trying to steer attention to the extent of disease causality and the broad range of sources for what causes a disease. As the differences in, in how countries handle the present COVID outbreaks make clear, the political ideologies or policy priorities governments follow has an impact on the emergence spread and evolution of the pathogens that arise. The reasons why COVID-19 spread have evolved so much in the US and Great Britain as compared to Vietnam and, and New Zealand have almost nothing to do with the molecular properties of the virus. A full zero COVID strategy is painful. Uh, months of lockdown where nearly everyone's paid to stay home, even with a vaccine available. That's a much shorter time than the 11 months of us cycling in and out of sort of lockdowns that allow the virus to continue to circulate. But our politicians insist on sending good money after bad to use an unfortunate if telling metaphor. So I think today uh, you'll have the opportunity to think through some of these issues and uh, hopefully come up with some uh, interventions that will allow us to uh, get out of this trap. So thank you very much. Thanks, so I was trying to write down the, the points and thinking about them, so I lost track of who said what. Um, I think that there, the, the, the question of, the, of work, what work there is to do, and the jobs and Build Back Better is a very interesting one, uh, because there's some people who say, oh, the job guarantee in the Green New Deal is kind of, I guess, almost patronizing or sort of forcing people to be, see themselves in a certain direction. But honestly, um, one of the things I think is very important to realize is that in the system change, there's a lot of work to do. And this is work that we have to do together. And, and I think that one of the things we have to understand is that we have work as sort of specialists, the, the jobs that we can do or the, the transformation of our training, but we also have jobs as citizens and activists that are more transversal and have to do with this knitting together of the movements and understanding, uh, making the space of moving forward together on these different issues. So I think that there's a lot of work to go around, probably a bit too much, but that the, the job guarantee has has its place in that. And I think is part of um, an important part of a red green alliance, to be honest, to see so that everybody sees the work to be done and has a uh, say in defining it. Um, in terms of meat eating as a focus in government, uh, I think that that's very important. So there's the Eat Lancet Commission. There's basically all these different bodies, um, including under the umbrella of the World Health Organization, and maybe Rob is gonna say some things about that as well, but that show that healthy eating and health, healthy eating that's healthy for human bodies and healthy eating that's healthy for the planet on average are the same thing. And I really wanna stress the on average. Um, I am vegan-ish, but I have friends who have to eat meat for their, for their own body, like because they have a different metabolism, because they have different things wrong with them. But they are like, you know, 0.1% of the population. They are not a large percent of the population. So I don't, want to, I don't want to be moralistic and judge people who are doing things differently for their health. But for most of us, for our health, it turns out to be lucky that our health is compatible with planetary health. And I think that this is a, this is a clear direction where we need to reform our agriculture, our government spending, our institutional meals. I mean, try going into an, an NHS hospital and getting something like a healthy vegan meal, like just try it once. It's not necessarily so easy. Um, so I think that that's something that we that that we have to, to work harder at, that our institutional settings promote health um, in that way. And that our, our uh, agricultural and food nutrition policies go in that way. So that's, uh, that's something that's where there's a lot of work to be done and it's quite necessary to do it fast. Uh, so I agree that that's um, important. Um, uh, in terms of the, I thought that Neil's point on building a movement was very key. And I think that, um, again, it goes back to the, the, the work that needs doing, right? 
I think that one of the things to, to take on board here, and, and it's a bit of a tough thing to learn for people who are new to activism or new to political engagement, is that there is no back to normal. And we don't go, we don't fight this fight and then go back to sleep. We don't go fight this fight and then go back home. There, that home is gone. I mean, it's like we left the, the Holocene and our good climate in the back in the back rear view mirror. We are never going to be in a space where there are not these crises and where there's not this struggle. At some point we're gonna be winning hopefully, and we'll think we're going to be at least slowing down the rate of destruction and death, but we'll still have this, these, these continuous battles and transformations to do. So this is the work of our lifetimes. This is the work of the century, the next century after that. So we have to, we have to be in it. And I think that that's one of the things that's quite important is to teach new people that this is an on-ramp forever, that this is not, hey, you do this one thing, come out with us this one time and we'll be good. Uh, it's quite a different mindset. And I think that that's something that we all, it all, it takes a bit of coming to terms with that we're not just going to be able to go back home and rest. That's thank, thank you, Julian. And I think one of the many things you said, which is important, is there will be no going back to normal. Um, Rob, what would you like to say about what you've heard this morning? Oh, I'd like to say a lot of things. I, I have to say uh, that uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, contributions. I mean, uh, I, you know, I thought, uh, you know, Tom and Celia and David and Penny and uh, uh, Neil, I think that all these comments are wonderful and you're all having, you're all getting in on all the parts of it. And uh, if I were to make a contribution being along the lines of, of talking through the connections between the systemic and tactical, right? And I'm gonna go back to the beginning of capitalism, although I'm not gonna give a whole lecture, but basically 500 years in which the global North used the global South as both its refrigerator and its toilet. And so all the damage was left down there, leaving millions of people to die on the annual basis. Now they've uh, damaged, and I include the South, global South here in the States of places like South Philadelphia, the South side of Chicago and South LA. So you have to think in terms of what global South actually means. But um, they have done such damage, however, that they're producing what the philosophers call a hyper objects, meaning problems that are everywhere all at once. And that's what cl climate change and pandemics represent. Uh, so there's really no escaping that dynamic of leaving the damage uh, uh, around the equator. Uh, and what this means then, tactically speaking then, is that we have to move toward working with our brothers and sisters in the global south on a regular basis. So it's about um, reaching out and making alliances with people you don't know and maybe you don't always politically agree with. So here in the States, we're reaching out to rural communities. I'm not gonna work with the Trump as fascists, not gonna happen, but you work with people who don't necessarily have all your politics, but are con have converged on many of the same uh, objectives and understanding. And you, you go through this slow, tough basis of talking to them listening to them and working towards some aspect of shared objectives. Um, the other thing uh, going on here in terms of the long systemic thing is that uh, what the world systems theorists talk about are the cycles of accumulation. So centers of capital change. You start off with the Italian city-states, they move to Spain. After Spain, you got the Netherlands, the, uh, to, the, to England and to the US. And what, is the, what are the cycles? On the front end of the cycle, the empire tries to turn money into capital and build capital uh, uh, imperial infrastructure. On the back end, when the empire starts to fall, they turn capital into money. What that means is they're cashing out, okay? That the, those who own capital are cashing out, okay? And in England, they're trying to turn cash out on things like your national health service, and make money as the empire disappears out from underneath them. Same thing in the US. You know, we all last 40 years took public health, neoliberalized it. That means neglecting it or monetizing it, sold it off so that we have no system by which when a virus enters, we can deal with anything about it. They're the those who rule are perfectly comfortable with that. So you don't look to them to solve the problem when they are. It's not merely a matter of persona. It's not just the fumbly Boris Johnson. It's it's it built into the infrastructure or the system state where you're at. So it's not about personas. You have to start thinking in terms of where we are in the, the cycle there. And what that lends itself to go is, yeah, you need to pressure governments to do contact tracing and all these other things. It's incredible important. I, 
point, and I think Neil made it a very good point about uh, making, showing competence and, and, and getting the greater public to understand what victories can, can look like. But it has to be a bigger picture about uh, uh, shifting out from underneath this. So once you see it's not about convincing uh, those who rule because those who rule are cashing out, then you understand the importance of things like parallel governance, where you start to build uh, new um, means by which the local community governs itself. And that extends in, from the factory to the neighborhood. And historically speaking, uh, England, uh, the continent, the US, there are plenty of examples in which working people, uh, in essence, develop these kind of parallel governance. Y'all know what a chamber of commerce is, right? That is something everywhere. And what Mike Davis does very good in his book, uh, the first chapter, he describes how uh, chambers of commerce arrived as reaction to what were called chambers of labor. Meaning in all these neighborhoods, you had working people who got together and organized in such a way that they could take on uh, the, the factory owners factory by factory. And the factory owners realized, oh, we're getting our ass kicked we're gonna to have to organize ourselves. So while the chambers of commerce continued, the chambers of labor, labor declined. So you have to start rebuilding those things uh, because you now understand the connection between the systemic and the need to intervene in the tactical. And that is the job forward because we are at a historical moment, as Julia said, that there's no one going back to, to what passed for normal and what normal calls to the disaster. So we don't wanna go there anyway. Um, so I uh, congratulate everyone here for really uh, converging on many uh, of what's needed and understanding of all this. And I, uh, I congratulate the organizers of Zero COVID here. And uh, in the day, in the rest of the day, I hope you guys spend a lot of time working some of this out and, uh, and my hat's off to you all. So thank you very much.